Welcome everybody to tonight's webinar on optimism during challenging times. My name is Casey Furlong. I'm a strategy consultant with GHD and sit on the AWA Young Water Professionals Committee in Victoria. I'll be the MC for this event tonight. And I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which I sit today, the peoples of the Kulin Nation, and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. We have three wonderful panelists uh, for this webinar this evening. We have Victor Purton, Chief Optimism Officer at the Centre for Optimism. Thanks. Board Hi, Victor. Board <laughs> member at Yarra Valley Water and founder of the Australian Leadership Project, amongst other things. He's also written books on optimism and I, I see that he is also an ex-politician. 18 years of, of service. 18 years and still optimistic. More optimistic. <laughs> and uh, we have Rosie Ween, the WaterAid Australia CEO. Hi, everyone. Great to be with you. And Alyssa Hunter, General Manager, Strategy and Performance, as of about 12 hours ago. <laughs> Hi, everyone. <laughs> Uh, so the format for the webinar will be as follows. I will share a, I will start by sharing a, st sharing a short story just to set, uh, set the tone for the event. And then I will ask three questions to the panel. Uh, and then we'll take questions from the audience. So feel free to start sending through questions at any point, uh, starting from now through the Q and A function uh, on your Zoom uh, tab. Uh, and there's also a chat function that you can use at any time uh, just to share, share, some, share some thoughts as we go. After the first few questions, I'll be scrolling through the Q&A questions uh, and asking them to the panel. And we've got some slides in the background, most of which have been provided by Victor very generously. Uh, the total uh, time for this session is supposed to be one hour, but we may also keep going afterwards for those that would like to stay for a bit more of a chat. We also have the ability to elevate attendees uh, should they wish to speak and share a story. Uh, so maybe when you, when you post in the Q&A function, if you would like to uh, share a story in relation to your question, you could maybe indicate it when you, when you ask the question. Uh, so without further ado, I will start by sharing a short story. Once upon a time, there was a farmer who lost his only horse in the mountains. His neighbors visited in the evening and said, that's terrible. And the farmer replied, we'll see. The next day, the old horse came back with two new wild horses from the mountains. His neighbors visited again in the evening and said, that's wonderful. And the farmer said, we'll see. The next day, the farmer's only son set off to train one of the wild horses and was thrown to the ground and broke his leg. His neighbors visited again and said, what a tragedy. And the farmer replied, we'll see. The next day a war broke out and the emperor's men arrived in the village demanding that young men come with them to be conscripted into the army. And the farmer's son was deemed unfit because of his broken leg. The neighbors visited one last time and said, what good fortune you have. And the farmer replied, we'll see. The moral of the story is that in the moment, it's hard to tell whether an event is good or bad because you never know what the consequences will be. Whether an event is good or bad depends on how you frame it because you are narrating your own story. What if the current crisis is a story about how you tried to reconnect with lost friends, went out of your way to support your family and took control of your health? In the story, when the farmer says, we'll see, what he's really saying is, the story is not over yet. So uh, to kick things off, we're, gonna we're going to ask uh, one question to everyone in the audience. It's a simple question, and the question is, how are you doing? Digna, if you wouldn't mind. So if everyone could please click on uh, a poll response for how are you feeling right now? We've got a range from 
leading with optimism to anxious, afraid, And uh, Digna, if you could uh, take control of when everyone's done uh, and share the results and we'll, we'll move on. Will do. Got 36 out of, oh, we're getting there. 38 out of 45. And we'll give it one more second. Anybody else wants to take part? No, I will end the poll now and share the results. We have quite an optimistic audience, Victor, you'll be pleased to see. Yeah, looking for stories of, of sharing stories of hope and optimism, we hope. Mm. Fantastic result. But we do have 10% of people that are feeling anxious and 15% of people that are hanging in there. So we, 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 we need to uh, speak to these people as well. All right, mo moving on. So uh, we'll start, start asking questions to the panelists now. And the first question is, what makes you optimistic? Uh, but, and I'll throw to Victor first, but in answering your question, Victor, could you please tell us what is optimism? Right. So um, optimism, um, as we use it at the Centre for Optimism, is uh, a definition that's been used by a range of medical researchers. Harvard, the American military, Stanford, um, and a number of other research institutions. So it's not Pollyannaism. It's not every cloud has a silver lining. It's not positive thinking, you know, everything's good. It's an expectation that good things will happen and that things will work out in the end. And that last one, that things will work out in the end. And I actually um, recorded a meditation this week, Casey, um, from a Middle Ages um, saint um, revered in the Catholic and the Anglican Church as Mother Julian of Norwich. And her famous statement is, all will be well, all will be well, all manner of thing will be well. So it's, uh, when we look at the audience that we've got here, they are people who are persistent, they are people who understand that um, you keep going because bad things happen to good people. Um, you know, we all go through our uh, Lots of our family are anxious now. People are fearful. Um, if you live in New York or Paris or Rome, you know, you may have lost a relative or um, someone closer. So there's a lot of grief and anxiety. Now, what makes me optimistic? Um, I think there's a bit of genetics in it. Um, my parents were refugees from Europe and um, refugees tend to be more optimistic than native populations. Uh, my mother is a great exemplar to me. She was teaching yoga uh, and doing all of the postures to the age of 91. Um, so again, there's that notion of, um, yeah, just keeping going no matter what happens. And of course she helped to teach me that meditation and yoga are, are very great underpinnings for optimism. And then um, every day um, as I'm publishing fresh statements of optimism, because I ask people from presidents and prime ministers through to people digging ditches and people at the moment they're not getting it but people smoking in laneways um, get accosted by me and asked what makes them optimistic and then I have a clipping service so I wake up at about five in the morning my first hour is a, a good strong cup of coffee and reading what articles are being published in the world that include the word optimism or optimistic. Thanks, Victor. I definitely have to agree with you there about a bunch of points, particularly the yoga and meditation. There's some things that just help, just like singing and dancing. Uh, dancing in the street is very good. Smiling at strangers um, is a wonderful way. I persist, even though people have got two buds in the ear and a phone in front of them, I still say, good morning. <laughs> Thanks, Victor. All right, next question to Rosie. What makes you optimistic? Uh, thanks, Casey. I'm still laughing at um, Victor leaping into people saying good morning, very contagious um, optimism that you have. Um, it is a pleasure for me to be joining all of you on this webinar and I too am on the lands of the people of the Kula Nation and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. I recently attended a webinar and um, there was a speaker who was a Bunurong 
man, Gideon Steele, and he was reflecting on the meaning of Womanjaka, which of course in Wurundjeri, um, I had understood means welcome. It actually, um, as he explained it, has a deeper meaning, which is come with purpose. Come with purpose. Um, so I come and join you with purpose tonight um, to reflect on this important idea of optimism and to really think about um, what brings me optimism, which it is learning from others and sharing with others. Um, it is also a great moment to pause and reflect, which is also something that gives me great optimism, but also an opportunity to share WaterAid's work. One of the things, um, Casey, I was appointed as Chief Executive of WaterAid uh, uh, three years ago now, uh, and as I've shared with others before, I had to do a manifesto, and in that, I used a quote from Margaret Mead, which goes along the lines of, never doubt that a small group of active, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's all that ever has. And I think one of the things that gives me incredible optimism is to see courage and activism from others. And I feel incredibly privileged to be part of WaterAid and all of our amazing people, but also part of the water industry. I mean, what other industry is there that has, like the water industry, created an organisation like WaterAid? People from the water industry in the UK in the early 80s saw the incredible crisis that existed in Africa and South Asia with people not having access to safe water. And that was how we started in Australia in 2004. People from the water industry in Australia saying it's just not good enough that right to today, over 2 billion people in the world don't have access to a decent toilet. The fact that there are two in five healthcare facilities around the world were at the point of care, so standing next to a maternity bed, for example, as a woman is about to give birth, the midwife can't wash her hands or his hands with soap and water. So it makes me incredibly optimistic to be part of the water industry, a group of people that not just created water aid, created thriving communities, addressing issues around domestic violence in Victoria and now nationally. Um, an organisation like AWA that creates such learning and connection. Uh, the water industry that has created pride in water, ensuring that lesbian, gay, transgender people are included and it can also thrive uh, in their workplaces. So that brings me great optimism to be part of this amazing group of people that have, uh, make up the water industry. Yeah, definitely. So some great points there. I think I think particularly the for me the the point about a, a moment to pause and reflect uh, really rings true at the moment. To to take the time to consider really what kind of world we want to live in. People don't have the excuse of being so busy running around uh, that they can't take a moment and consider where are we going and what do we need to change. All right, moving on to Alyssa. What makes you optimistic, Alyssa? Hello everyone. I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which I sit, um, the people of the Kulin Nations, and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. And I just want to say, Rosie, what an inspiration. That's a really hard act to follow. Um, when, I was, when I was thinking about what makes me optimistic, I was thinking about, um, uh, I think part of it, I'm, I'm similar to Victor, maybe it's in my DNA. I always try and look at the the positive things and I always try and um, bring joy and and laughter to any situation and and you know obviously that doesn't always work but um, I try and uh, think about the things that we can control rather than things that we can't control and I think if we focus on those things um, we can be much more optimistic about how we how we do things. When I thought about this question in regard to our current situation I was thinking about you know, I hadn't really thought about it until I was in, in this moment. And, um, and you can see some photos there of my family. Um, and one of the benefits I didn't expect to get from isolation was the time at home. So like many people, I spend about 45 minutes traveling to and from work. And um, that is time that I don't have with my family. Now, I do love time to, to reflect at the end of the day. So, you know, there's there's positives in that. But this um, has probably created an opportunity for us to really 
reconnect as a family. Um, we don't have all the activities that we're running around to all week. Um, and so we've actually got out and done things that we love doing and we do do, but we've done them more frequently. Um, you know, Easter for me was challenging because I'm normally with family and my mum always makes a big, um, a big cook up of pasta, I'm an Italian background. So I did that with my daughter and we had such a great time and, and it's hopefully things that I can then start to impart on her and, and, and my son as well. So that was, that was, when I thought about this, I was like, what am I optimistic about? I'm optimistic that we'll take some of the learnings that we're getting from, from being isolated and being so um, close together. And hopefully some of those things will form habits that will take on well beyond um, the however long we're in this situation for. And and what and what habit is more important that where than where you started? Joy and laughter. That's there's not many things that joy and laughter wouldn't help. With some small exceptions like funerals. All well, right. Is, I um I once had a friend who auditioned me for his 80th birthday. Um, to do a roast of him, <laughs> and he wanted me to repeat it at his funeral, and I did. That we should do that. Let's just bring it in. To just make it a, a norm now. I, it looks like we've got our first Q and A come through. <laughs> okay, we'll, we'll 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 table that one for later. Uh, all right, we're we're moving on to the uh, the second polling question for the audience, Stigner, if you wouldn't mind. So, so th we're, we're doing polling uh, in, in an AWA webinar for the first time. So we will be testing with you later whether the, the polling enhanced your experience of the event. Uh, so we've got two questions in here. What helps you stay optimistic during difficult times? And the second question is, what are you doing to help colleagues stay optimistic during these difficult times? So the, the, the first one is uh, focusing on yourself. And the second one is, what are you doing for others? With these questions, you can actually select multiple options. We encourage you to select multiple options. There's probably no point doing only one. Mind you, the comments I'm getting on SMS, et cetera, I think we should have added Rosie's name to the list. <laughs> How do you stay optimistic during challenging times? Rosie. We just listen to Rosie and we, we look at the work she does in East Timor and elsewhere. Victor, what's your answers to these questions? Um, well, regular positive uh, conversations. Um, actually, on our Habits of Optimists um, on the web page, uh, we have uh, Smile Like an Optimist, um, Sharing Stories of Hope and Optimism, Disney really nailed that a couple of years ago and Coca-Cola and Frostbank and others have followed them down that track. Uh, meditation, you know, I meditate myself and I record meditations for other people. Um, yoga, I don't do enough if you look at my girth, but love it. Um, gratitude, hugely important. And then visualization. I'm, I'm always sort of imagining um, the beautiful things that come next. And I spent the last couple of hours anticipating um, this wonderful event so beautifully moderated by you Casey and, and what's what are some simple things you do for others to, to bring bring optimism um, it's actually today for instance one of the charities that um, looks after mental health um, we've talked about um, doing a series of workshops for their workers and what we're going to do is um, in groups of 20 you know I'll talk about what makes you optimistic but the most important thing is we'll be asking each and every one of those people around the table, what makes them optimistic. And it can be very moving. I did one in, I've done several in prison and there was one where a, a notorious prisoner talked about his recovery from cancer. And the next prisoner had arms that were sort of the size of your waist case. He was this huge man. And he was, he was literally brought to emotional tears. He said, I can't speak. So when you do this, it, it opens up a, a fantastic, fantastic um, camaraderie in, in staff and the like. And, you know, everyone who's listening, your bit of homework tonight is go and ask your partner or your kids, 
what makes you optimistic? Yeah, there, there is something really powerful about sharing how you feel on the inside, which is what people often don't do. You know, they, they go through life with this very sort of surface level facade and only after a couple of beers will they say, oh, well, you know, really, this is how I feel. This is what I think. Yeah. I think the people who run um, Are You OK, um, it, it's a great passion and a thing, but I think what you want to do is bias the conversation towards the positive. So instead of saying, how are you, which in Australia elicits the response, not bad or not too bad, 65% of the time, ask a different question. You know, hello, what's the best thing happening in your day? Um, or instead of saying good, terrific, or not too bad, just say, God, I was on this fantastic um, Australian Water Association webcast and God, it was a good day. We're going to have to do one of these ourselves at work. It, it starts a conversation rather than how are you and not bad and not too bad. Yep. Uh, I, I, well, we might get all of our panellists to weigh in here, but I think there might be a little bit of donkey voting happening. Looks good. I'm se se sensing a pattern where the, the, the top question gets... Oh, oh, wait. Have these been resorted based on the answers? Is that what's going on? Yes. Okay. It automatically puts the top answer to the top. Oh, okay. Well, that 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 makes sense then. All right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, any any comment, Alyssa? What, what do you think? Anything stand out for you from these uh, results? Look, I would one hundred percent agree. I think regular positive conversations is is um, and I, uh, being an extrovert, I feed off others. So I um, I really love the opportunity to get the energy from a from a group of people. Um, whether that's work-related, friends or family. So, yeah, agree with uh, the percent. Uh, Rosie, anything you've done, anything you've done that's helped your colleagues stay optimistic recently? Uh, yeah, lots, Casey. And when I think about that and I, I look at this list, I think it's a real reminder for me that I try to do for myself and with my colleagues to notice how I'm feeling because I think that's so important to notice and check in with yourself and then think about what action you might take. And I like this idea of smiling at people or doing something because sometimes the feelings follow an action. I think especially at the moment when, you know, we are all stuck in very different situations, getting moving, trying to do something I think is really important. And um, something I often share, Casey, that I'm really aware of is um, especially, you know, imagine you're sitting in an aeroplane and the flight is, well, sorry, no one can imagine that at the moment. Should I said it like that? Should I? Whoops. It's a, remember when you could sit in an aeroplane and you will again, of course, and the flight attendant says to you, put your face, your oxygen mask on before you help anybody else. And this is the time where we do have to practice self-care uh, and I really am very conscious of that for myself and then I can offer optimism and stories of hope for others like all of you and Casey if I just build on that a little bit for me in terms of thinking about my colleagues um, across WaterAid and other partners that we have I think it's really important that we remember this experience is experienced by all of us but all of us differently uh, we know from a lot of the studies that there are very gendered impacts of COVID-19 that we need to be aware of as leaders and make sure that we're particularly checking in on people at risk of family violence, really thinking uh, about different people that are uh, perhaps vulnerable in terms of their health or their family members are on the front line doing all this incredible work for us and how are we supporting them, thinking about as um, uh, many of us talked about before of when you're also trying to work from home and got children or others that you're caring from, the extra pressures. Also, we've heard some of these terrible incidents in Melbourne, and I suspect others of you around the world also of increased incidents of discrimination and how do we really be aware of that um, and support others that might be experiencing that. So I'm really trying to think about taking care of myself and then can also support others in my team and recognise that other people are experiencing it differently to me and uh, make sure I'm exploring that with them and finding out how I can help them. All, all good answers. All right, well, let's, uh, 
Let's move on to the next question, which is a little bit more practical. How do you make connections in a virtual world? And uh, from this point, I will uh, let, let, let whoever wants to go first, go first, I think. Uh, so how do you make connections in a virtual world? And actually, well, we do have this beautiful slide constructed by Alyssa. So why don't we do, let Alyssa go first on this one? All right. And um, so I think the other thing that um, for me, um, when I was thinking about this, that made me optimistic was also that our ability to adapt so quickly um, and how we are all really in this together. Um, but I think the reason why uh, this one's probably most relevant for me right now is that I've literally been uh, a week and a day in a new role. Um, and I was, um, when I was, uh, you know, over Easter, as I was about to join Southern Rural Water, I was like, how on earth is this going to work when I have to do all my introductions and everything um, via Zoom? Um, you know, even just how do I get access to my computer? It was delivered to me, which was, um, which was all very good. Um, and I was really well set up. And the reflection I've had in a week in is that it's been like an induction on steroids. And I've been so, um, I suppose, there's been so many opportunities to have so many more opportunities probably to connect than if I was starting um, during a normal, uh, you know, situation because I've basically been on Zoom um, and meeting people. Um, we've had, there's lots of things Southern Rural Water are doing similar to what I'm sure every other organisation is doing. So I've been making sure that I'm, um, you know, wellness sessions and fitness sessions and all sorts of um, opportunities to, to connect. And I've been making sure that like if I was in a, um, an actual office, I've been connecting through those forums. I've been making sure that I've been, um, you know, catching up with as many people as I can. And I think um, it feels like in a week I've been there a lot longer and I think that's largely because of um, the number of people I've been able to connect with and I've been pleasantly surprised that you can still make great connections virtually. Um, it's really just about all those things that you do in a, in a day to day. It's about, you know, having conversations, trying not to start a meeting and not have some of the chatter. I think all those things are so important in, in how we connect with each other, understanding, uh, you know, I, I, I know who has a dog and a cat and who, you know, I've met that many children and husbands and wives, with, which I wouldn't have done for a lot longer. So I think that um, we over sometimes overcomplicate things and um, you can still get on and connect with people virtually. Yeah, couldn't agree more. Rosie, how, how, about, how about yourself? Any stories to share? Sorry, I covered up my mute button. Um, I think Alyssa's covered some really brilliant tips there. I think the only thing that perhaps I'd add of one of the things I've learnt, particularly as we're working and connecting virtually during a pandemic, which, you know, understandably, and as the poll showed, people have been uh, feeling anxious. Um, for me, I'm also working hard at how do I keep connected, but also keep disconnected. So have some boundaries for myself um, in terms of giving myself breaks and doing things that really ground me. Um, there's a, a, a spot not far from where I live where the Birrarung or Yarra River meets the Mullum Mullum Creek, which is a really special place for the Rwandari people called Tikalara Place. Um, and for me, I've been trying to make sure that every day I finish my day trying to get there either by running, walking or riding, ground myself, disconnect and get home. What, what suburb is that in? In Eltham. Right. Fantastic. Eltham research. Yeah, that bit. Yeah. All right. And uh, Victor, got any, any tips for making connections in a virtual world? Um, well, one of the things I did with um, on LinkedIn was to all of the, well, not all of the people I'm connected to in New York because there's thousands, but um, just to send a hope everything's going okay and, you know, we're thinking of you. And that elicited a very powerful response. Um, people really appreciate it. Not putting too much, you know, not a whole paragraph, just a sentence or two of something quite simple, just saying you're thinking about them. And then I, the other story I want to share is my mother was watching my Zoom this morning with John Hagel, 
And she said, Victor, where, how do you know all these people? You know, the, someone from Denver and someone from Denmark and someone from Mongolia. And I said, well, that's the global life we live these days. And so for me, we've never been busier. And what's wonderful is when you're talking about optimism and infectiously optimistic leadership, um, people gravitate all around the world. And particularly for the water sector, I think everyone who's listening in, um, I still remember being in Southern California and Tim Brick, who was the head of Southern California Water, which provides water for about 30, 40 million people. Um, when he met me, he then gave a speech and recited nine Australian water reforms that he would like to bring to California. And so, and, and we also did a great event with Austrade when we, at the World Bank, uh, we were doing a presentation on Australian water reform and we catered for a hundred senior execs. Um, 250 turned up. Um, and so this admiration for the Australian water sector um, should never be misunderstood. So I, I encourage everyone, you know, I see so many friends and some people I haven't met on the attendee list, um, reach out to people in the water sector in other countries because they'll really appreciate it. They love, as, as Rosie said, um, you know, all of the things that are happening. Choose TAC, for instance you know, is, is one of those powerful things for people in third world countries where, you know, of course, if you live in India, you are going to have to buy bottled water a lot of the time. But in countries like Australia, people shouldn't be wasting money on bottled water. They should make donations to um, WaterAid. Yes, uh, absolutely. And uh, just for myself, I've noticed two particular things about uh, my connection, making connections during this crisis. Firstly, I can call way more friends than I can catch up with. So I might catch up with one friend a week when I can easily call three friends a week. So that just the, the, the volume. And the second thing is distance doesn't matter. So you've got a friend in Ukraine or a friend in Portugal that you haven't seen for three years. Give him a call. Why not? Moving on. Third question. What good news have you heard lately? And from this point on, the slides have no particular sequence and will be just uh, flicked, flicked through. Uh, but what good news have you heard lately, Rosie? Well, it's going to come, oh, look at that picture. It's going to come as no surprise that I'd just like to share a couple of stories of WaterAid's work. As I mentioned at the beginning, for me, I got a lot of get a lot of energy and optimism from others and seeing their courage. And that's what I've seen from water raiders around the world. So for example, in the last two weeks in Papua New Guinea, we've been working with our government partners there and local partners. While there's less infections in Papua New Guinea at the moment, they only have one or two cases, we're still able to work with physical distancing uh, in communities and the work that the teams are doing to get hand washing messages out because we know that one of the critical uh, prevention strategies for COVID-19 is hand washing with soap. So getting those messages out and doing work to get water and soap into healthcare facilities. So for example, in Pakistan, we've been working in some of the biggest hospitals uh, to help get um, water supply into the hospitals for the healthcare workers and in support the government uh, to get soap and uh, hand sanitizer in as well. And to me, uh, Alyssa, I think you touched on it earlier, seeing the innovation and positive action that people are doing um, within WaterAid, but also all of our partners really uh, staying with us. Um, one of our other partners is Who Gives a Crap? Um, I hope that many of you have heard of them. Hot breaking news, stock is back. So if you're on the waiting list, it's coming. Um, but seriously, WaterAid couldn't do their work without the incredible support and donations of our supporters. And I've never been uh, more grateful for that support as we do the life-saving work that we do um, around the world. So that's just some of the good news. Even though there's a lot of scary things happening, some really good um, partnerships and work to address it. I, I imagine you've always got a little bit of good news to share, Rosie. So Absolutely. that's great. Yes. Um, Victor, what good news have you heard lately? Oh, lots and lots of... We, we share them every day. Um, my favourite is still... The, the, the story of the century, which is that we have halved 
the malaria death rate this century. So since 2002, we have halved the death rate. So today, 1,000 children will live who would have died. And um, there's a, lot, a long way to go. There's still a lot of people sick and dying of malaria. Um, but you've got um, governments, um, the private sector, um, really racing. And a lot of it here in Australia, um, you know, a lot of research being done at Walter and Eliza Hall, um, at Garvin, at Griffith University, Monash University. So it's a great positive news story already. And there's lots and lots of Australians and Australians in the water sector. Um, Cheryl Battergall, who has been the chairman of the EPA here and now the chairman of, um, of one of the organisations in relation to um, global water. And um, she told the story recently of Australia bringing technology to Malaysia, you know, in a little village that's never had clean water, where if you wanted to go shopping, you had to pay the ferryman, um, the integrated water um, centre. Um, that's, those are great stories of Australians delivering around the world for better health through the water industry. Definitely. Alyssa, how about yourself? What's, what's some good news um, you've heard? So I'm going to, mine was, it's very topical and it's very current and I suppose it's still, it's um, another innovation, but uh, the, I'm sure everyone's aware of the um, Anzac Day on Saturday and um, I think that the innovation around the dawn service, um, you, the driveway service, um, so uh, there's an app and, and um, the RSLs are all involved in basically walking to the to your driveway. There'll be um, through radio stations or through the app, you'll get, um, uh, you know, you'll be able to listen to and, and enjoy the service. You can take your own candle or you can get one that's online. I just think that's an amazing example of how, you know, something that's so important to Australians and that we don't want to forget and we're looking at ways to do that differently. Um, and hopefully an opportunity to connect with some of the people in our local communities as well. De definitely. All righty. So it's, it's that time. We're going to start taking questions from the audience. And we have, we have our top question from Lucia Cade, who, who might have a story to share along with this question. We'll see how, we'll see, we'll ask the panelists first and then we'll, uh, we'll touch base on that. Uh, how do you manage balancing optimism with also planning for things going wrong? Just like uh, my internet cutting out in the middle of my one story. Uh, who would like to go first? Um, Victor, you're off mute. We've just, um, we've just finished a global study on strategy and optimism. And um, 375 strategy professionals from 36 countries. 80%, um, no, 90% uh, believed that strategy should be an optimistic process. Um, only 60% had been involved in an optimistic strategy process. Um, but particularly knowing Lucia's um, uh, excellent leadership she'd be not surprised to know that less than 20% of them actually measure optimism. So what we foster at the Centre for Optimism is realistic and infectiously optimistic leadership. So you, you've got to plan well. And, and um, Mick Farrell, who runs ResMed, um, and ResMed, does anyone know what ResMed does? It's the, it's the great marriage preservation company. They produce snoring machines. So you um, wear it over your nose and you don't snore anymore. Apparently it's saved millions and millions of marriages. And uh, they're now moving, of course, the American government and the Australian government have got moving across to compressors rather than um, these smaller breathing machines. But Mick Farrell says, you, you, you can't be in this, in this medical device game unless you are an absolute optimist, but it has to be an optimist grounded in reality. Good strategy, good business plan, and, and I, a very Australian expression and a good oh shit plan. So Lucia, it's, it's an optimistic strategy process, but brilliant business plans, including that oh shit. And I talked to the chief of staff of um, Twiggy Forest, who said that's Twiggy. He has optimists all around him. He pays pessimists by the hour. They come from law firms and accounting firms. Um, and he's got that plan that when the coal price is 100 bucks, when the coal price is 80 bucks, when the coal price is 60 bucks. So it, it's being optimistic, but it's having that great planning. And Lucia 
um, is one of those great leaders who's both an optimist um, and a great planner. Uh, absolutely. Uh, Alyssa or Rosie, either of you want to weigh in on how to balance optimism with planning for things going wrong? I think um, thinking about it, Lucia, and thinking of um, your story at the beginning, Casey, of the story's not over yet. And I think that sense of optimism and hope and also for me, I guess there's something about perseverance. Um, so seeing a challenge and embracing it for well, what can we learn from this and how can it, you know, either help you grow or to achieve your um, goals. I was um, listening to a story um, as part of a leadership program that we have at WaterAid, which was recalling um, a young scientist uh, in the early 1900s, a young woman called Alice Heffernan. And she discovered that when x-rays, she noticed that looking at childhood cancers, she discovered that it was affluent families, women getting x-rays um, that caused the childhood cancers. And the story was all around her process and approach. She had someone, his name was George, I think he had a surname, it was George. And George's job was to challenge Alice and challenge Alice uh, to really make sure she had the most robust uh, research and to me there's something about embracing the possibility that things can go wrong with that sense of optimism so that you um, perhaps get further than you intended or learn more than you intended. Absolutely. Uh, uh, Alyssa, any, anything to share there? Um, I think that it's probably all been covered but the, the, the key one for me is I think if you, it's, it's really around that resilience and understanding uh, you know, yes, we need to plan. Um, we we need to plan for the worst, but often out of a crisis is where you see you get real innovation and, and change. So I think um, it's that balance. Uh, we can't not uh, plan for for all different situations, but if we take an optimistic lens, we can look at the positive and what we might get on the other side of that. So um, I think Victor and Rosie covered that one beautifully, though. I, I, ha I have my own little little response to this one, which is around outsourcing. So, so you you outsource your pessimism to some other person or some other process, right? So you 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 have a process in place where you outsource all your pessimism to that, and then outside of that, you you're an optimist. You know, like you you send off the report once it's done. You're optimistic after that. <laughs> All right, moving on to the next, next question from the audience. David Brooks of the New York Times describes two sets of virtues, the resume virtues and the eulogy virtues. The resume virtues are the skills you bring to the marketplace. The eulogy virtues are the ones that are talked about at your funeral. What would be the eulogy virtues you'd like your loved ones and colleagues to say about you? This is quite personal and touching. Oh, Thank you. No, oh, it's not. Pete. Yes. Hey, Pete. Uh, who wants to go first on this wonderful question? I, um, I had the opportunity to interview Peter on his optimism. And um, if anyone wants to watch a, a brilliant interview with a brilliant thinker, um, on the website of, of the Centre for Optimism, there's the video of me interviewing Peter. Um, and he's thought very deeply about this. Um, for me, it's one of those really interesting questions. Optimism doesn't peak in the average population until you're in your late 50s into your 60s. It's being able to put the normal anxieties of life into their context. And one of the things that I talk to a lot of older folk about is deathbed optimism. That ability to die and yet die with dignity and express emotions that make other people optimistic. And so one of the pieces of work I've done, again, on the Centre for Optimism, we actually have a whole page where we collect eulogies um, for optimistic people. And so um, I think my answer, Peter, in brief is, is um, he was infectiously optimistic um, and he smiled a lot. That would satisfy me. Rosie? Oh, so Peter, we, I'd like to hear from Peter at the end of this as well. It's a really beautiful question to ask. I think I would hope maybe 
um, three things, that I was kind, uh, that I was courageous, and that I was enough. In the words of Brené Brown, who I really admire, that I was enough. Lisa? Well, this one's a really tough one. Um, and um, I think for me, it would probably be um, that my energy and enthusiasm was contagious. I, I, have, a, I have a little, little uh, quote to share for this one. The secret of life is to die before you die and get that perspective back on your life and, and, not be, and also not live your life in fear of death. Moving on. All right, next question from Jeff Cabell. Clean fresh water from a tap is one of the common things mentioned by many people when I ask, what makes you optimistic and grateful? How are you sharing the fantastic positive message about the fact we are fortunate to have such a great gift this is an excellent point. Uh, this is a sort of check your privilege type, type point. Just how good is our lives here in Melbourne or in the rest of Australia? Uh, who'd like to go first with how lucky we are? What about you, Casey? You're, you're the leader of the young water professionals. Why don't you lead? Why not? Um, so, yeah, but I don't want to make it too Melbourne centric, but I really do feel super grateful to be in Melbourne. Uh, great tasting water, great parks. Um, I'm very lucky to, to be um, close to some, some wonderful parks here. Uh, and and every, every day when I drink water, I appreciate the taste. I really do. Uh, maybe I can share a story. I recently met a Chinese guy who'd moved from Beijing to Melbourne. And um, I asked him what he really enjoyed about living in Melbourne. And he said, drinking tap water. He said, I just love drinking tap water. He said, the second thing I love is being able to go outside without a mask, but that's not quite the same today. But it was this notion of this clean water, uh, the clean air that, that we can enjoy. And so, you know, a lot of people around the world can't do that. And I had the opportunity to visit Rosie's um, projects in East Timor. And when I saw the joy and the innovation that followed the provision of clean water close to people's houses, um, you see what a difference it makes. And then the other one I really love is Choose Tap, you know, and um, that notion of instead of people wasting twice the price or four times the price of petrol now, on a litre of water, they can actually use that water for better purposes. I'm constantly spruiking how good our water is all the time. And unfortunately, it's people that live in Melbourne that I'm spruiking it to that don't recognise the value in a drinking bottled water or um, filtering it. I'm like, you don't need to. We've got the best water in the world. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I totally take, um, um, yeah feels very fortunate to have such uh, a wonderful thing and we turn the tap on and we're so fortunate that um, we have great running water and that everything that we do goes away safely as well. So I think we're extremely fortunate. Um, so I think we've covered lots of points around being grateful for water and Jeff, I think in my experience, because the work of course of WaterAid is in um, the many the developing countries that we work in and I do find that people do appreciate it when they pause and think and then realize how lucky they are. I can't take you to the water aid program but I have brought one of my favorite props with you so thank you Jeff for this great opportunity to share it with you. Can you can you see it? Can you tell what it is? It is a plastic poo, don't worry Alyssa. I saw that look on your face. It's a plastic poo. And, you know, I do find, Jeff, that a lot of times people want to talk about water, of course, because it's essential to life. But actually many of the challenges that Water Aid's addressing is because of the lack of decent sanitation and the fact that 
6 billion people in the world don't have access to a decent toilet, that people don't have, that 40% of households around the world can't wash their hands. And we know that that is so crucial, not just for people's health, it's for education. Imagine girls going to school when they've got their period and there's nowhere for them to manage their period. It's so important in terms of gender equality. We know that women often carry the literal burden of collecting water, but also the indignity and risk of assault if they're using, not able to use a toilet that's safe. Um, so for me, it's so often sharing those stories, um, not just of the challenge, but also that we the opportunity, yeah, we know the answer. We know the answers to these challenges and we can absolutely make it happen. And I, my hope for this tragedy that is COVID-19 is that we shift gears and globally, we recognize that it is absolutely within the power of this generation to make universal access to clean water, decent toilets and good hygiene, something that we achieve. Um, I think it was Nelson Mandela said, that, you know, let this generation be the one to blossom. And I really hope that we use this challenge to be one where we really do um, let our generation blossom and remove all the inequalities, well, most of the inequalities, if we can, in our generation. All righty, next, next question from the audience. Is optimism mainly inherited? Victor mentioned his mother earlier. Is it inherited or learned? Uh, the science around it is around 25% of it is inherited. Um, so um, you can come from optimistic parents and um, be become pessimistic yourself, allow yourself to be ground down. Um, and a lot of people who have joined the centre, I mean, we've doubled our membership during this pandemic. So I'm hearing a lot of stories about what makes people optimistic. Um, a lot of people make the choice. So it's, it's really about choices. And when we look at that slide that's still there, you know, it's, it's doing those things and um, having those positive conversations, smiling people. So a short, a short answer to a very good question, Amy, um, is um, it's not mainly inherited. It's probably about 25% inheritance. Um, the rest of it is choice. Casey, I've got little science to go on for this, apart from um, hearing more and more about the practice of gratitude and the study of neuroplasticity and changing the circuits of your brain. And over the Christmas holidays um, with my 13-year-old son, we read The Resilience Pro Project, a really great book and podcast that I'd recommend. Um, and we really did find from that practice of doing... Um, uh, gratitude journal every night and shifting some of the conversations we had as a family really did shift our perspectives on some things and I think that showed me the power of how you can retrain your thinking patterns and your, your brain um, to, to learn some of those practices. I don't think I can add anything to that. I, I would agree with Rosie and I think um, that was some of the things that I, I hope that we will start to see coming on on the other side of this is some of those new learned positive habits. Yeah, I, I might share like this, there's, there's two really specific things that have really sort of changed my brain while I was an adult. The, the first was a couple of quite traditional yoga retreats. Um, with lots of singing and chanting and meditation and stuff like that. And the second was just some sort of eye-opening documentary type things um, that are freely available on YouTube. Uh, my favorite one is called Inner Worlds, Outer Worlds. And it's just sort of changes the way you see the universe and you see your own brain and, and uh, sort of resets things, gives you a chance to, to, to go back, be an optimist like a kid. Why not? All right, next question. Oh, we've got Andrew Chapman up next. What do, you, what do you think, what good will come out of this crisis and how will the world change? Hey, Casey, are we, uh, can audience members also speak and share some of their thoughts on these good questions as well, or is that not? Well, we'll we make, get, should we get Andrew Chapman to answer his own question? Yeah, I don't know Andrew Chapman very well, but if you just <laughs> put him on the spot. Yeah. Yeah. I'm here. Andrew would we'll love to do that, I'm sure. If you're all happy, then I'll elevate people to uh, join in the conversation. Perfect. 
great. Yeah, let, let's get, let's put Andrew on the spot and get him to answer his own question. That sounds good. Digna, keep us posted. Well, while he's coming on, I think, Elisa, why don't, why don't you again, you know, talk about these things you've seen. Um, people yeah, so for the... me, I think it's um, one of the things that I think will be um, the new ways of working. How do we, you know, this is this is like a trial of, um, of working remotely on steroids. Um, you could never do this. And how many organisations have managed to adapt so quickly? I think... Um, the workforce as we know it will, will, will adapt and change. And I'm not suggesting that working from home permanently is the answer, but I think there'll definitely be different things. And there'll be some positives, um, you know, for women that are coming back from, you know, having children, all that balancing. I think um, we can see how well we can connect. Uh, I think, you know, how do we need to travel? I mean, it's Southern Rural Water are currently looking at where we've got a very large geographic area and our people are saying they feel more connected than ever, which I think is just a, an absolute um, great outcome from um, oh, something's just weird. Happen. Oh, yes. All these people are joining. Um, yeah, so I think, I think it's, it's how will we work moving forward? I think we won't, it won't go back to the way that it has. And I think that's going to be a really different change. Hi, Andrew. Yeah, over Hi. to Andrew. Andrew, what, how's the world going to change? Um, I agree. I think in regards to that flexibility of working, the environment, not everybody trooping in to the city, having, having a desk, being able to work from home remotely, that's going to create tremendous flexibility. It also probably will empower the regions uh, and create a better work-life balance. You know, you wake up, you can, you, you, it's two minutes to to get to your desk for work. And you need to go and have a walk between or do interactions between. It's uh, a dramatic change. Uh, a dramatic change. Uh, a dramatic change. Uh, and David's by the sound of it going over and over. Yeah, this is the risk. <laughs> People need to have background noises off. Do you have the power to mute that person now? Digna, Digna, use your power to mute people. That's the way to do it. I'm not sure who it is. It's the it's the mobile number. It's 0407. <laughs> it's uh, there it is. There we go. Yep. Um, um, I think that I think that's a fantastic people. It is a challenge that the levels of connection that you can have, but I think we're finding ways around that, and that, I think that's great. And change. Yeah, I, brings new new opportunities yeah, i've got i've got one for this that um my my mother is quite a serious climate change activist and uh, she's, she's got a she, her main point uh coming out of this crisis is what about all those people that said we don't have enough money to fix climate change and then you look at how much money they've invested in trying to fix this crisis it's like way more than it would have taken to fix climate change so nobody can say now you can't fix climate change Well, it's, it's been interesting what's happened with the fuel oil price and the whole greenhouse ga gas emissions. Tremendous change that's happened. Uh, what's that going to mean in the, you know, in the driving forward? I, I, we may well be able to achieve many of those environmental objectives just by the way the change we work, the way we work. Those are opportunities. And we, we've got, we've got uh, Lucia and Pete Morrison on now who asked questions before. Lucia, why don't you answer the question that you asked before? Well, it's good. Uh... I heard you for one second and then I didn't hear you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Can, Casey, remind me, remind me of... Um, so the question was really about how do we stay optimistic but plan for the worst and how do you balance um, that way of thinking and 
in fact i i loved um you know i loved all of all of the answers you can't uh, avoid things going wrong um and it's the attitude that you take when things do go wrong that makes the going right uh possible so you know i think um I find it quite hard personally sometimes to um, imagine all the things that can go wrong. I've, I really have to, I really have to work at that, that you know, risk side of looking at um, and take seriously all of the bad things. Cause I, I tend to look on, on the upside and the upside I find far more energizing. So I find I have to work quite consciously of looking trying to work out what, what things could go wrong to then uh, be able to put things in place. Um, and in fact, sometimes I, I just let that go and think, well, whatever does go wrong, I can't predict it. I will just take the attitude of how to deal with it when it does. So I do need to surround myself with um, the right kinds of pessimists and downsiders um, to make sure that I don't leave anything um, unplanned for. So I, I, I like that. I like that Twiggy Forest um, idea. Let's pay others to to manage, to think up all the downsides so that I can focus on the things that energise me. Which and is I the think Lucia, one of um, your great attributes um, in your chairmanship has been the innovation in the firm, that, that it, you've got an innovation entity and you're prepared to invest and, and people can make a mistake and go on because as you know, the best innovations come from try and try again. And I think that's been a real yeah. tribute to your leadership. Thank you. Yeah, it's, def it's definitely not one or the other, is it? You don't, you don't plan for the worst or be an optimist. Sometimes you can be much more optimistic if you have a plan. <laughs> All right. Oh. Yep. I think we've got Jasmine next, have we? Oh, Steph. I, I was going to throw to Pete and get Pete to answer his question since it was such a thoughtful question. Hello, everyone. It's really nice to talk to you. Uh, well, I think I've considered this a fair bit. Uh, I think my eulogy values or virtues are uh, uh, really about uh, being more bright hearted rather than bright minded. I'd like people to think of me that way. Um, so while I'd like to exercise my intellect, I'd much prefer people to remember me for my heart. I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. So sometimes the shortest answers are the best answers, Pete. <laughs> All righty. Uh, well, I don't have a plan for where to go after this. We've got more questions. Should we, maybe I should ask a question and then pick a random person <laughs> from the audience. Casey, I'm noticing quite a few people do have to go. So yep. we're having a few nice farewells from people. Oh, all right. That's a that's a good point. Okay, so well, goodbye to whoever would like to leave. Uh, thank you, Minakshi. Thank you, Alice. Um, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Lachlan. Uh, so whoever needs to leave, thank you for coming. Have a good evening.